What's it worth to be a follower of God? What's it really about? Does it give me more than just some ticket to heaven? I get tired of people just thinking that's what Christianity is about, when actually it's about changing the world, doing justice, making a difference. Hey, it's an election year. We can make a difference. Join me for a message in about 20 minutes from Isaiah, and I'll be talking about all of that. But when the weather's nice, Sunday mornings, 930, Walker Park, behind the community center in North Muskegon. I hope you'll join us and be there. Bring your mask, bring your chair. However, I want to be also very clear. We do not have a plan to meet together in the building for worship. You can have small groups in the building, meetings, uh, all those things. Within the governor's guidelines, uh, 10 people. That seems to uh, our local health department, and it seems to um, the wisest among us that that's an appropriate limit. So I want you to know if you are interested in hosting a group of people uh, to come to your home and share worship, you are more than welcome to do that. In fact, we will be providing and you'll see a link if you're watching this on Facebook, we will be providing a very simple, usable uh, guide for discussion following the message. So please uh, get involved, connect, and God bless you. Love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures.
Then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? What can stand against? What can stand against? It's time for prayer. Let's join first in focusing our thoughts and our hearts and our minds, letting go of the extraneous things and nothing between my God and me. And then let's pray together. Lord, for all those who are in need and hurting right now, we're wanting to extend your love. We, we need to be the people who share your love. For those who don't have access to health care in our own community because they can't afford it, because they don't have transportation, because of whatever the complicated reasons are, I pray yeah, help us be part of the solution for them and bring justice. For those who are wondering how they're going to begin a school year uh, when they have uh, an awkward mix of in the building and online and they're feeling very disconnected and unready, Lord, may there be peace for those who are sick and for those who are looking after those who are sick, we pray. Those working in hospitals and nursing homes, caring for those with COVID-19, those who are uh, sick in lots of places, at home, recovering from surgeries, we pray. For those who are grieving, letting go of loved ones, letting go of close ties, finding a way alone forward, we pray. For those in leadership who are responsible for decisions, we pray. We pray for our church that we can be effective at sharing your gospel, at sharing your good news, and also effective at being part of making the world better and better, moving closer to justice here in Muskegon and elsewhere as well. Everything we pray in Jesus' holy name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, community kids. I bet most of you know the song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. But did you know that stars don't actually twinkle? As the light of a star travels into your vision, Earth's atmosphere causes disturbances in the light's path, creating the illusion that the star is twinkling. Did you know that the sun is the closest star to Earth, but it's still located 4.24 light years away it would take 70,000 years in our fastest spacecraft to reach the sun. Did you know the Milky Way is the galaxy our solar system resides within 
and it has an estimated 100 to 400 billion stars. Did you know that scientists believe there are potentially 170 billion galaxies in the universe? Some are called dwarf galaxies with about 10 million stars, while others are huge galaxies containing an estimated 100 trillion stars with a T. Did you know the Bible says this in Psalm 147.4? He counts the stars and names each one. Can you believe the God who created all the stars, the galaxies, the planets, the trees, animals, people? The same God created you, loves you, cares for you, and wants to have a relationship with you. Today, ask your family if sometime this week you can stay up late and see the stars in the sky. And remember that the God who created everything loves you. Have a great week, my friends. What's your salvation good for, anyway? I think we've run a real risk of letting our salvation make us complacent. Like this, well, I'm saved. Jesus saved me. Jesus died for me on the cross. And so, we kind of say like Bill Murray in Caddyshack, we say, so I got that going for me which is nice. And if that's kind of how salvation, the deliverance of God works, if that's what Christ is good for, to make comfortable people remain comfortable, then we messed up. That's not, that's not right. That's not what it's about at all. And I don't just say this for me. I mean, ever since I became a Christian, which is, you know, several times when I was nine, when I was 14, and then continually after that, um, every time there was always a call that came to do more, to be more, to become, yeah, to grow as a disciple, yeah. To make disciples, yeah, I've been talking about that for weeks, but also a call which is uncomfortable, a call to transform the world. You see, when Jesus was talking to his disciples about how he was, you know, he had just come back, he's resurrected, they say to him, is now the time that you're gonna, you're gonna establish your kingdom? Because this is the real thing they were hoping for. The real thing they were hoping for was not complacency. The real thing they were hoping for was not a ticket to heaven that you could put in your wallet and leave there until you die. That's not the thing they were waiting for. And that is not the thing that we as Christians really should be promising ourselves or promising other people. We should really be talking as Jesus talked in response to that question. He said, wait a minute, you're asking me he didn't say all these words. I'm paraphrasing. I'm putting words in Jesus' mouth, which is probably dangerous. But instead of saying, um, yes, I'm going to take over the world now. I'm going to run things. I'm going to establish my kingdom. He said, no, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will give you power. What does that mean? The power to do miracles? Oh, well, that's nice. That's nice. That's good. That's useful. I'm sure it would be very useful to do miracles. But ultimately, we were given the Holy Spirit so we could bring all the changes that God wants in mind. So we could make God's will be done. Thy kingdom come. We are sharing responsibility for that now. It's our job. If you believe in such a thing as salvation in Jesus Christ, then it should give you the opposite of complacency. It should give you instead great courage 
peace. Okay, I don't have to worry if I die today on the Bettis Bridge, if I die today protesting against what's wrong, if I die at the hands of evil today, I am not afraid. That's what salvation can do for us. That's how we can be changed. Let me read to you from Isaiah. And, and all the disciples, and certainly Jesus, knew this passage perfectly well. Isaiah chapter 51, starting at verse 4. Listen to me, says God. Listen to me, my people. Give heed to me, my nation. Let me just pause and say, I've never really felt that America at its beginning ever chose to be a divine nation. It never chose to be a Christian nation. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in the Founding Fathers. They didn't really go for that. They chose not to. They distinctly chose not to. But if you want to claim that this is a Christian nation, that it ought to be in any way God's nation. If that's what you like, if that's what you want, then let me tell you, you should take this passage right here seriously. When God says, give heed to me, my nation, or any nation, for a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. My justice. The this is it. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out. My arms will rule the people. The coastlands wait for me. And for my arm, they hope. All the people who are oppressed, he names, people in the coastlands, those who need deliverance, who need help. Who are the oppressed people right now that God wants to encourage right now? Whom we, we as followers of Jesus, are called to help right now with all we've got right now. He says in verse 14, the oppressed shall speedily be released. They shall not die and go down to the pit, nor shall they lack bread. And in our own world, we could say, nor shall they lack access to good fresh food, nor shall they lack access to health care, nor shall they lack access to equal justice under the law, nor shall they lack decent schools all on a par, nor shall they be prejudiced against anymore, nor shall they be subject to American racism anymore. Verse 16 is to Isaiah, but it's to us too. It's to me. I'm taking this personally because I may find it a little challenging sometimes to preach about anything, uh, and, and I find it challenging to preach about the making of disciples and sharing our faith. I find it challenging to do that. But right now, God is getting on my case, saying, Jeremy, this verse right here, I have put my words in your mouth and hidden you in the shadow of my hand. And those I've looked after you, I've protected you, and I've given you what to say. Stretching out the heavens, laying the foundation of earth, and saying to Zion, you are my people. But that is not separate from you are responsible. You know, when all this was written, Isaiah was this part of Isaiah was probably written after the exile, after 517 BC, but 500 years before Jesus, folks. Uh, when this was written, it was clear that oppression came from kings. 
because kings got to do anything they wanted, say anything they wanted. They were the justice, they were the army, they were the everything, all wrapped up in one person who got all the power. We did this great thing um, 250, 60 years ago and founded a nation based on the principle that people get a share in their government. It's called democracy. Maybe you've heard of it. But the thing about democracy is not just that we get to not be taxed without representation. The thing about democracy is we are all sharing in responsibility. And if there is injustice in America, and I believe there is, then I share in the responsibility. When I became a citizen, I began to share in responsibility for every injustice in America. I began to share in full ownership of any policy that keeps poor people poor. And there's so many available. The fact that people are allowed to be absentee landlords and not care for their properties uh, in, in the Heights. The fact that uh, there's disparity in Michigan. We're, we're among the five worst states in the country in terms of disparity between uh, funding for rich school districts and funding for poor school districts. Why is that? Well, that's down to you. And it's down to me. It's down to what demands we make of those who, whom we elect. And some of those demands, we, by the way, we get to make right now. This is election season. You've probably noticed. And we get to make an expectation clear. We need there to be. We expect there to be justice. And we can do that through our political system because we are a democracy and that means ruled by the people. So, let the people stand up for what God wants. Let the people stand up against the things that oppress. What are the things that oppress? I mentioned a couple of them already. The disparity in funding between different school districts is actually something we could do something about. We can actually change that. It's just a state funding formula. How come ours is worse? How about if we st we don't vote against every rise in taxes, but we actually pay what's required to make the schools become what the schools need to become and make the roads, if, as long as you want those, make those become what they've become. Now, what is the church to do? Don't we feel powerless? Don't we feel weak? Don't we feel hard done by? Don't we feel like life is just hard sometimes? I'm so sorry. But, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the church or you're the governor or you're running a, running a company or whatever. You're feeling all these things right now hitting you at once. I know it. You're feeling like the, we're surrounded by this pandemic. It's all over us. It uh, requires constant work and thought and, and planning and you're surrounded by um, a renewed uh, sense of injustice about uh, black people relating to the law and to other authorities. You're, 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 you're meeting all these problems, the economic crisis that comes, and then that all feeds into, into education. Uh, what about health care? You know, how do we make sure that all people can have health care? Doesn't it seem, doesn't it seem all the time as though the problems are bigger than the people who want solutions? Let me tell you, do not underestimate the ability of the people to make a difference. You don't have to be George Washington. You don't have to be Martin Luther King to make a huge difference, to speak up for what is right, to stand up for something huge, something important, something difference making. You don't have to be that. You simply have to get in touch with the people and start pushing what has to be done.
It's weird. We can actually do that. I speak as a, as a person of privilege, a person who has always had enough to eat, often had too much to eat, as a person who's always had access to health care, even though I haven't always gone to receive health care. I'm a person who's always benefited from the education system, from educational loans, from uh, all of these things. I'm a person who benefits so often in so many ways. Um, what's it like speaking from the other side? What's it like speaking from the side of oppressed people? In America right now, what's it like instead to speak as, as a black person, speak as a Hispanic person? It would mess with your understanding of God. I mean, if you were hearing this passage from Isaiah and it was promising, God is coming, God is coming, God is delivering, my deliverer is coming, my deliverer is standing by. Wait a minute, there's a difference between God standing by and God coming. But I want to tell you what, God is sending, God is sending us, and we, we ourselves are arriving at the edge of the, ba of the battleground, at the edge of of the war against injustice, the war against poverty that ought to be going on, the war against inequality, the war against racism, we are arriving at the edge of that battlefield. And what are we doing? We're saying, hmm, I'm not sure I can do that. I'm not sure I want to do that. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to take sides. I don't want to be political. I don't want this. I don't want that. We'll get over it. It is our calling as Christians to take arms, in Shakespeare's words, in Hamlet's mouth, to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. That's our job. What if I were one of the oppressed people and not one of the benefiting people? I might write like James Cone, who wrote maybe uh, 50 years ago, almost. Um, if God is not for us, if God is not against white racists, then God is a murderer. And we'd better kill God. And that last part is a little shocking to us, isn't it? Because we don't want to kill God. We want to keep God. But let us not keep God on the shelf. Let us not keep God as our personal uh, lifestyle coach on the sidelines, but instead let God be our God who leads us into battle against injustice, who leads us out to make a difference, to put ourselves, our lives, our money, our time, our love, our passion, to put it on the line on behalf of what is right. That is the kind of God God intends to be, and yet we like God to be more peacefully on our side. And if I were an oppressed person and I looked at all of the oppressors, all the people who share in seizing the benefit of the systems that are broken in our favor, if I were an oppressed person, wondering why the schools in my neighborhood were never good, never well equipped, well staffed. If I were an oppressed person, wondering why my neighborhood never had access to decent health care nearby, never good transportation options, and everything worked for other people. Then I might say, God is against us because all these systems are so far beyond our ability to fix, right? But they're not beyond the ability of people to fix. If we are the people with all the privilege, if we are the people who get noticed, if we are the people who get heard, if we are the people who have rights, if we are the people, then if we are God's people, 
then a difference has to happen. Change has to come. Justice is what God wants. To do justly means to look after those in need. To do justly as a nation, as a state, as a county, as a community, is to care for those in need and to not let these differences persevere that take people down, that knock people down so much. We are doing the opposite of justice right here in Michigan. The opposite of good. And the opposite of good is surely evil. Friends, I don't want to be a politician. I really never have wanted to be a politician and never want to take sides in any political race. It is such a political season. I want to remind us of where we stand as Christians. We stand as Christians committed to changing the world for good. That is our job. Would you join me in making a personal commitment to stand up more boldly than ever on behalf of what's right, to speak more loudly, more forcefully to more people about justice in God's name? Thank you. growing up in church, when the subject of giving or tithing came up, um, it often felt a little bit more like law and a little bit less like love. As I've grown, I, I realized I didn't want to just give away a set amount so I could say I checked the box off and avoid guilt. I realized it's so much bigger than that. God doesn't need my money. He wants my heart. He wants my eyes open to seeing the needs of people around me. I want to make the world better with my giving. I want to give 
because I want everyone in my community to know that God thinks of each person with an unexplainable love. I want to give so that essential workers know they are important to this world. I want to give so that people who are hungry and in need get food and shelter. And I want to give so that Pastor Jeremy and the rest of us can show and tell and teach the world that with God, there's always a next step. If you have this same passion for changing the world around us, then we will honor your gift by using it wisely. You can mail in your check to the church or go to our website, communitychurchumc.org and click on give. You can give a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift. Your giving makes a difference. And we thank you for trusting us to be good stewards of your money. Show us, O oh God, what is good. You have shown us, O oh Lord, what you require. You have heard all our songs, how we long to worship you. Yet you've told us the offering you desire.
Friends, thank you for joining in worship today. I pray you go out and feel and find that you are blessed, strengthened, encouraged, pushed, and that you will go and respond to God's great work in your life by being a great work in the world, by being a great bringer of change, a great doer of justice and mercy. Thank you for sharing in worship. I hope you'll keep in touch with us at communitychurchumc.org. Share the love. We want to share it with you. God bless you. Go in peace.